Yo, yo, yo! Ah! If The Walking Dead was the grand slam to take the lead, The Wolf Among Us is the nuts in your mouth home run right after, probably the second best Telltale game ever created. It's escaped the crack dar up to this point, but no longer. All this juicy, crack-headed material in the first episode left me salivating like a Discord mod, pinpointing a meme in general. So let's go smoke some crack off the perfect image of an incel's ass and play Telltale's Clue slash The Wolf Among Us Part 1 on crack. If you enjoy, check out some of my other crackery. As is tradition, let's go over all the episodes and make our predictions from the thumbnails. First episode, these two fine gentlemen are duking it out to see who gets sloppy seconds in this polyamorous relationship. Second episode is a professional Reddit mod who got big off crypto, getting seduced by a porn star for his money. Third episode, Big B gets drive-by, ejaculated on, and has to catch the perpetrators. Episode 4, I get I know you are, but what am I, leaving me enraged. In episode 5, the gravitational pull of my TCLR-induced massive genitalia pulls the moon before Gru can. We get the background lore, Fable Town is pretty much fairy tales becoming a real-life thing, and to protect the most at-risk fables, as they're called, namely the My Little Ponies from people like this, they put on glamour which masks their true appearance, and Sheriff Big B Wolf prevents anyone from Italianing and switching sides against us. Game starts and I'm in a porn taxi in New York looking to kickstart my career, but surprisingly, no women are willing to take a ride in exchange for being filmed for Pornhub's bestiality section. Shocking, I know. I get kicked out for my poor performance, throttling my Johnny Sins aspiration. $400 to the Bahamas? That's a tank of gas in Europe. Fuck Wolf Among Us. I'm going to become the Tand Among Us. I'll see you losers later. I get to a three foot toad who looks like his hobbies include abusing his family and wasting paychecks on the pub. I threaten to send him to an eighth grade science class if he doesn't buy some glamour and start looking human soon. A TV gets thrown out in the background, presumably due to someone finishing Fear the Walking Dead Season 7. God, that was terrible. Please. Trash. As we hear someone going one on one with Blueface's girlfriend upstairs as I go to investigate, leaving Toad to unleash Niagara Falls from his salivary glands somehow in his hatred for me. I take my time, of course, no need to rush in as I pick up a matchbook, never know when I'll have to burn evidence of my police brutality. Put the phone back into its position so no witness can hear me abusing my power while I leave the woman to have the time of her life in an abusive relationship. I bust my way in, catching Keemstar in 4K Ultra HD, hand in the proverbial unconsent panties, running a cooking class, teaching a student exactly what a salt really is. I hold him down while she spits on him as I'm looking to grassroots launch my porn career. I end up letting the woodsman know his breath smells like Spongebob in that one episode and suggest he brush his teeth. However, his embarrassment compels him to pick up a shaving knife as a whip. It what are you even gonna do with that? You're gonna light up my fade now? I, in turn, can't take the disrespect to my drip lying down, so I pin him against the bed and unleash my father's secret techniques on Keemstar. He tells me he's worried the 18-year-old he's dating is gonna get pregnant, so I give his balls some shock therapy, putting the swimmers to sleep, followed by himself. The woman isn't leaving until she gets paid for her getting railed. Unfortunately, though, it seems like the woodsman has already had his balls drained before he paid, a rookie mistake, leaving no incentive for him to honor the arrangement. The beating started after she told him he wasn't a base Sigma male for taking his life savings and putting them all in cum shot coin. I, however, realize that I'm a cop and as long as I don't step on his neck, I can get away with murder, so I suplex him out of a window. I wake up on top of the toad scar whose face says exactly what type of insurance he's got, but our conversation is cut short as the woodsman decides I look woman enough as the woodsman starts strangling me. It seems he isn't part of that 13% causing my John Dice to act up and before I show him my new shark tail grills, the hooker caves his brain in and I watch as she robs his body, expecting hush money in return. Corruption doesn't come cheap, you know. Faith, the hooker, is disappointed as she finds out the woodsman's next week's meals are going to consist of one ramen packet rationed throughout the entire day, which isn't going to be good news to a pimp named Slickback. I was going to arrest her for her lack of corrupt- uh, robbery, excuse me, but her blatant violations of the Geneva suggestion make me fall for her. I guess it's a good thing fables are hard to kill. I catch up to her and give her a matchbook to speed up her long camp as I try to remember the lines from the how to pick up girls search I did on Google this morning and ask her the first answer I got from that being what her occupation was, but her lips are sealed. Hey, you like my ribbon? Wonder if this obvious cry for help is going to play a part in the story. Her sexual services come cheap or expensive, depending on how you look at it. I mean, a flight to the Bahamas is only 400 bucks, and while I have some money to help her, I really wish I could help. 
I tell her I need a statement, which she responds by saying she'll visit my apartment later, presumably to give me a free trial of her $100 product. Bewildered at my location potentially being ducks, she lets me know that isn't the case and that everyone knows I'm a broke bitch, so broke in fact that my location is automatically ducked. That's a double fister right there. I try to hold back the floodgates, but it proves a futile task. You're not as bad as everyone says you are. Yeah. I'll see you around. That's the end of the intro as the obvious cigarette light into theme song begins, one of the greatest beats I've ever heard. to the Woodlands luxury apartments and catch an informant for the all cops are bad Facebook page peeping for weaknesses on the grass. That has to be at least a misdemeanor. As I prepare to give her 20 to life for stepping on the front yard, she lets me know she doesn't respect my authority and to not tell Beast I saw her. Oh, oh yeah, beauty's cheating, cheating. I tell her I won't tell Beast she's getting Thanksgiving turkeyed by Prince Charming and go on my merry way. Well, it's nice to know that Paul Blart is on the case. No Orlando shooter is getting through with him on the job. As I make my way to the crib, I find myself in between a love struggle as Beast asks me if I saw Beauty. Knowing it's New York, I threaten to seize his Tim's if he doesn't fuck off, leaving him with little choice but to comply. I get halt. Damn, I really live like this? This is a luxury apartment? I have an ice tray in the freezer, empty since I assume water's getting too expensive for Big B, while the only consumable we have in the fridge is ketchup. Can't wash down cigarettes dry after all. I get to a giant pig whose house I blew down all those years ago couch surfing, and I tell him get off or I'll finish the job. Also, Colin is the best character in the game, despite four or so total lines. That for me? Nope. The house didn't blow itself down, Big B. That's all I'm saying. Do with that what you will. Now, I'm not saying it's reason enough for me to have definitely been offered a drink, but, uh... It would have helped ease some of the pain you once caused me, yes? I tell him I was hungry and still am if he's thinking about getting fusion summoned with that ketchup I left, as he then proceeds to reverse the course of nature, roasting my ass to a crisp. By being big and being bad. Don't say that shit in front of people. It's embarrassing. As a reward for going goblin mode, I give him my drink, and I doze off before I get a knock on the door, waking up excitedly, penile urethra flopping about, getting ready to put more than my trust in faith. It's no. But before I can ask her if she wants a white Christmas, she tells me to follow her, and with her looking like her favorite series is getting a live-action Netflix adaptation, I know it's something serious. Under the security co- it's faith. Someone left an object in her mouth very different than the one she was expecting, I'm sure, unless necrophilia is a thing for werewolves. It turns out a silver ring was attached to a ribbon. I've seen enough. I've come to the conclusion that she died from asphyxiation. No need to thank me. I conclude she was placed deliberately for us to find, meaning it's a declaration of war. My investigations conclude that the attacker needed a tampon midway through the murder mystery before making do with a piece of fabric, all while suffering some unexpected hemorrhoids on the escape. What are you doing? This is a thorough investigation, Miss White. I'm gonna need you to lift up your skirt. She asks me some stupid questions as if I'm the hint system in every worst Waldo-based game and lets me know she's telling Crane to come to the business office at this hour. They're overworking my hairy ass. I better be paid in cold, hard gold for this overtime. As I'm making my way to work, Vanilla Ice calls me out uh, for, for going to my job. And what great work you do, Sheriff. Hmm. That didn't feel very genuine. I get to the 4chan r slash robot nice guy blaming Snow for his inabilities to find a mate, leaving him so angry he couldn't smell me coming somehow. With a nose that big, one whiff of expired milk might as well be mustard gas for this guy. After we come up with a plan for me to carry out, he can't find the bottle of wine Snow was meant to purchase cause, you know, she had better things to do after finding a severed head on our doorstep. Which might have even been Crane for all we know, I mean those sideburns are a lethal weapon at this point. Turn around a little too quickly and next thing you know, Isis is sent their best offer. Gonna need to see a license for that there beard, sir. Still can't do a British accent. I've had enough and decide to hit him with the white boy trub hard knit until Snow saves my channel from being snapped out of existence. I ask why he's bringing wine to a massage. Apparently he's trying to substitute personality and looks for money. A worthwhile strategy, I hope. Anyways, Buffkin the monkey comes out with the elusive bottle of wine and it's between him and Colin for dummy mode this season. Buffkin! Hello, Miss Snow. 
Drinking? This early? Where did you get that? It was by Mr. Rickabod's desk. Then don't you think it probably belongs to him? Maybe. Also, he's the only person who asks how my day was. Everyone up to this point wanted an organic sex toy to ride me for 80 hour work weeks or to let loose their sexual frustrations on. You know what? Screw it. I'm gonna add Buffkin to my boy collection. We tell my boy to get the Book of Fables as I try my luck on a magic lamp before going to the mirror to observe my suspects. He, however, wants me to partake in the historied rituals and to write my requests for him. I, all right, all right, fine, okay. Mirror, mirror, if you're able, make my biggest stop disabled. Well, shit, apparently he can only show me different people, so I ask him to show me Buffkin who's drinking on the job again. Can't blame him. He came in earlier than me. He's probably working as slave labor for 225 an hour with the speed dial to ice on crane's phone as blackmail the woodsman is walking down the street after drinking his pain away and then he asks for snow for some reason even though she's right in the room with me it's a bold strategy cotton let's see if it pays off for him nah 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 we gotta go bigger mirror mirror as you flicker show me the biggest thickest milkers I I decide to ask one more question to end off this round of CCP roleplay. <coughs> mirror, mirror, as in videos prior, show me the average TCLR subscriber. That's right, by leaving a like and subscribing, you too can become a cop with near limitless powers. That include bribes, engaging in corruption. Not only that, but you also have the ability to discover who was in Paris that fateful night, and two, more importantly, not miss out on future content. As Buffkin brings the books, I check out today's horoscope. I'm gonna get suckled by a villager. Suckle her so hard, in fact, her inflated titties will make her lose balance and fall out of a tower. And then give Julius Caesar a run for his money after killing the town's bustling bosom provider. As I'm looking through our childhood memories, I find the symbol on the ring we found and find the symbol on the other book because of my boy Buffkin. Donkey skin. Yes. What does it say? <sighs> donkey skin girl, also known as donkey skin, <laughs> also known as <laughs> ass skin, <laughs> uh, prefers to go by the name Faith. Poetic? Buffkin, we don't need the commentary. Nah, 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 I ain't having this. Buffkin, I love your commentary. Come work for me, I'll give you two bananas an hour. The story goes there was a king with a bombshell of a wife who on her deathbed made him promise he'll only marry the most beautiful woman in the land. But after finding no one who could raise his Excalibur, this was before Viagra after all, he decided to play the field spell Alabama. She put on a donkey skin and escaped until she found a prince before living happily ever after until the ever after came and she started making anyone who had a hundred dollars in their back pocket feel like a prince themselves. The prince named Lawrence, her husband, husband, she was ready for me to put that dog in her earlier today and she was doing all that with the husband. Damn, he must be packing that can of miniature sardines if she's willing to get railed by the wolf among us. Prostitution, I can understand. I mean, $20 is $20, but the only thing I was paying her for was that cab fare back home. The old king is dead and it seems like Prince Lawrence is playing tic-tac-toe on his wrists. Snow lets me know I'm not the only one who couldn't resist the allure of stalking before we head out to the prince's location. That is until we get a call from Mr. Toad. There's someone rummaging up in the woodsman's panty drawer before he's forced to cut the line short after a foreboding line. I open the door for Snow and with earlier stalking episode in Colin's comments, I can only assume Big B's ready to show her that dog in him. Here I have to make a choice. Do I go to Prince Lawrence or Toad's first? Toad's a tough Toad. Let's go see if we can place bets on the prince's tic-tac-toe game before his biological batteries run out. I decide to boast my superiority to the cops and engage in home invasion right in front of them. Good thing Crane didn't come with us, else he'd be passed out by now and our esteemed prince is watching Judge Judy while being shot through the heart. I open the pull-up bed, inviting Miss Snow to observe how I make it snow and we get a suicide note from the prince who presumably caught Faith sneaking up to my apartment last night. With Snow staring right into his soul, Dory the fish wakes up in a panic and as we let him back up, he explains that he thought he'd be dead by now. Big B remarks on his heart being a little bit more to the center. OBJECTION! That is factually incorrect. Man quick scoped his heart right in the left ventricle. There's no way he should have woken up from that. Snow asks him what he was thinking and he said it's cause he's been a failure for doing something to her. Whatever that something was, we'll never find out cause he won't tell us and Scooby-Doo and the gang aren't available for this case. Considering his failure to off himself though, it seems like it's a genetic trait. I decide easing blows isn't in my repertoire and tell him his wife's been Lincoln to which his depression grows larger, lamenting at Georgie. Well, I take everything I said last video back. 
That's the face I'd make if I got schlumped by a William. Getting Williams might as well be an honorable discharge and compared to getting your switch flipped by Georgie. The IRS shows up at the door and me and Snow have to hide. She tells the prince to act dead since he already looks like he runs with Casper's Crips. He picks up the Glock, but I think nothing of it since it is America after all. The caricature of a man who unironically uses Milady walks in and I have to be careful he doesn't whip out his katana so I just observe for now. After getting a close up to his record breaking 43rd chin, I jump out to Lawrence about to off himself, but I get stuck. Somehow this obese greasy sleaze is faster than me and even jumps higher than what are those humps? Has he put on a fat suit to get everyone to underestimate him? Eventually I track his dust prints and hit him with the WWE rope belly drum, although his sizable insulating material protects him from the worst of it. I ask him who's employing him, to which he says it's confidential, and I realize once again that I'm a cop, turning off my body cam footage Going dark. before taking him in to be tortured. And then his brother comes in with a French beret, giving me some of that thick fat smack pat. Snow, where were you? While I was getting my ribs kicked in, she was just documenting the entire event like a National Geographic journalist. After berating her skills on our way to Toad's house, I tell her how I abused my powers to attempt to murder Keemstar and that we'll be getting a call from Toad's lawyers later today. I get in just as Toad finishes whipping his son in an alcoholic fit of rage and tells me that it was all a false alarm and that the sounds and screaming I heard was just a rusty water pipe upstairs and that I should go home. I tell him I'll leave after he shows his hairline to which he concedes and Snow goes and does the important job of inspecting TJ's bug collection for foul play. Man tells me to mind the upholstery which... Eh, come on Toad, you got a busted lock, broken lamp, this shit is damper and dirtier than the pond you came from. Shitting on the walls would be considered a makeover at this rate. I notice a broken lamp despite the nearby electrical plug being occupied and also some blood on the walls to which he says he cut his hand. I find an octagon shape on the table matching the one for the lamp and catch him in his first Objection. line. There's also a pole used to Gaddafi someone and Toad says he dropped the makeshift selfie stick trying to take feet pics for money. You know what degenerate shit is on rule 34. That is as valid a guess as any. Oh, and it slipped a bit. Sliced up in my foot like a seashell. Objection! Jade, you dropped it on your foot? You told me before that you cut your hand. Yeah, no, I did cut my hand. Gotcha. I open the window and find some dust prints frog shaped and he says he had to break into his own house because he forgot the keys. And to his broken door with a lock that's been busted for weeks according to his own admission. Being three for three on the interrogation, I'm about to bust this case wide open as TJ comes in asking Snow for pickup tips. Leading to Toad's fatal flaw being the hug though and after getting cut attempting to fix his receding hairline, he gives us the defeated animation. He takes his hat off and tells us it's one of the Tweedle twins the ones who assaulted a cop before talking about what underwear they possess and then blaming me for not coming here first. Eh, that's fair, I guess. And he wanted to tell us, but, you know, the Tweedle threatened to sit on his son if he talked, limiting his options. And then TJ snitches on his pops. Dad borrows things from people who live here. Uh... Sometimes. We possess the fur for the good of the commune and find a letter. And after Toad's glorious commentary... Now, of course there is. My luck, it's a map to some bloody doubloons. With my luck, it'll be a map to some bloody doubloons. I'm getting better. I really want to open it, but I can't do that to my guy after almost stealing his wife, so I decide finding Dory is the best call. Finally, we leave as Toad Jr. shows us those tips Snow gave him. Nice talking to you, TJ. Thanks. Uh, see ya. Unbeknownst, Rin. Love Toad Jr. Really wish he was in the game more. As we're leaving, Toad tells me to check the trip trap for the woodsman, since if he's snitching, he might as well get it all out of his system and reduce his prison sentence as much as possible. Snow's mad at me for uh, apparently doing my job going to the woodsman in the trip trap next. Don't know what she thought detective work was. This isn't an episode of Blue's Clues, Snow. Me and Snow reminisce on our failures this episode, and she asks me who I think did it, to which I blame the pimp. About as easy as guess as any, I'd say. We both do the speak at the same time because we want to bang each other trope and she cries at all the poor fables who try doing things legally unsuccessfully but the corruption of her administration means only the rich men like Bluebeard who can buy their way to Congress proposals get any attention. Oh yes, woe is you. I'd normally arrest her on the spot for spilling everything although I know better than to bite the hand that lets me abuse my privileges as a defender of justice. I tell Nancy Pelosi she'll fix it, probably, after another year of 50% returns on her stock port Portfolio. After we make it to the hood and to avoid the obvious vulnerable women with no support system hunter, we decide I take this alone. After a heartwarming goodbye, I make my way to the trip trap, a speakeasy where we have a transitioned hunt from the purple dragons. This is some nice steel. How about telling me who gave them to you? 
Yo mama. Some vanilla ice drinking his sorrows away. I tell the people who ate the system to give me, the representation of the system, the woodsman they're harboring, which shockingly failed. After looking at her owner to figure out what to say next, the cougar thinks she got one up on me by telling me to fuck off. What a smug smile you got there. How those five fatherless children doing? Built like she needs that five pound makeup routine to look normal. Underneath it all, she's a bridge troll. Wink. I find a patron's cup that hasn't been dumped out for some reason, and after inquiring what why? If you want a cleaner place, feel free to get the fuck out of here. I'm sensing a very hostile tone from you. Don't deny it. I'm good at picking up on this stuff. Let me solve the mystery for you. They're pickled eggs. Oh, I know what they are. I'm just trying to figure out why anyone would eat this. <laughs> Man's dropping Chris Rock numbers on the cougar and Vanilla Ice's head. If he's not careful, Will Smith's gonna come out of nowhere and slap his ass for being so based. I sit next to my best buddy and Han tells me to stop bothering her customers. Where? You know what I mean. She's about to hit me with a revenge disc so disastrous it's gonna count as a third degree burn, so this is not for the weak-willed, of course, anyone who has any past trauma. Please click away from the video right now. Give me a Midas gold. You want a lime? No. Well, I don't got any anyway. <laughs> Immediately proceeding that shockingly poor attempt at humor, the woodsman comes out. After letting them know they'll be getting life for aiding a suspect and that Eminem is better, Vanilla Ice can't have that last line leave unpunished. And he shows me that he can roll his eyes to the back of his head. Wow, uh, c congratulations, at least you beat Eminem at something. He confesses to everything. He was gonna rob her and got the nerve to do it too, but I'm not interested in his horrific fantasies, although it turns out my appearance saved Little Red Riding Hood a few doubloons that faithful night, so there's that, I guess. He only did it for the reward, though, and he didn't get none. Get shit on, Keemstar. I ask him if he killed the hooker he was abusing, and he gets spooked. Of course, him beating and threatening to kill the woman who showed up dead hours later might not exactly be 4K, although it is a close-up of security cam footage at the local 7-Eleven. Gren vouches for him as if his statement is gonna be enough to stop my ultimate abuse of power. Gren heats things up and transforms into a frost troll drawing from the memory of a four-year-old. She did need that makeup up to cover her troll face. Good to know. He smacks me and I try fighting back. Oh, come on, that has to be passer interference at least. Where's the technical rep? I'm left with the relative comparison of fighting against my drunk dad with ineffective punches, followed by getting ragdolled by him across the room. After swinging me around like a post-birth abortion oh, partaker. <laughs> Got that dog in him. I turn the tables and just body him. He can't stop the pure physical strength I'm exuding as I unleash my police brutality to its fullest extent, giving him the Helen Keller makeover before using the classic take his breath away trick. I stab his shoulder, break his femur, and worst of all, tell him his 2D waifus wouldn't love him if they were real. He's had enough. Nah, you only face the hog if you lose, and so I tear. his whole arm up. Don't think I forgot about that foul earlier. Give me that elf. Woodsman tries to sneak out and calls me out for my abuse of power. Power, although I used the ironclad defense of he was reaching for a weapon. After all that, Tweedle bowling ball rolls in, and I have to pick one. One person to catch the giant. It 
muck-shaped jello or killer team star. I decide I don't need the scoop today and catch Tweedle dumbass since from the magic mirror earlier, we We saw that the woodsman was drunk, so I highly doubt he'd have the mental capabilities to kill Faith and throw her on our front porch like a scheming crime boss, nor does he have the athleticism to jump the fence. Now you might be thinking Tammy over here might be too big for pole vaulting, but need I remind you is Hops has him on track to represent America in the Summer Olympics for long jump. And the episode's final scene, I get to a police scene in front of the not-so-luxurious apartments, tie up the brother, and go to investigate. And that's episode one. The Wolf Among Us on Crack continues today as the second Telltale game on Crack I've done for TCLR after The Walking Dead on Crack. And it had a glorious first episode where I grassroots launched my porn career with the hemotesis fetish, find a severed head on my doorstep, get smacked by the Tweedle twins who were growing chins like they were tree rings, unleash the fullest extent of my police brutality before catching someone without their obesity license, and finally the climax of Snow White who herself showed up in the interview to be part of the headless horseman's new look he's trying out. Let's go smoke some crack off the hole in the neck of Snow's post Ice's adventure quest's head and play the Wolf Among Us on Crack Part 2. We start off in a police station where this bitch thinks she can abuse her power against the power abuser himself, fueling my rage, needing a cigarette to calm me down. She asks me how I'm doing, to which I respond I need head, preferably one still on its shoulders, but I'll take what I can get. She calls me aggressive and a sexual harasser and necrophilia isn't cool dude to which i start using my right to remain silent because i feel like i've said too much after blowing smoke right in her face showing her the fearless absolute giga chat i am she starts seeing me as an equal abuser of the law in fact she starts seeing me as her superior in that aspect and starts bleeding out of her nose with her brain not being able to compute how i could out scumbag her before symptoms of amnesia set in as she tries asserting herself as the real dirty dan finally seeing my opportunity i put on russ's top 10 hits of the decade causing everyone with ears to pass out as the mutton chop choppers with a box duly named evidence strolls through as we see the NYPD state-of-the-art encryption technology on full display here. My goodness, if we were anything less than 200 IQ, we would have definitely missed this giant box named evidence. Okay, maybe we should take the photo of Snow's severed head. Okay, well, I, I guess we aren't dealing with the Pink Panther here as he almost leaves a clue at the crime scene. I give this shit to Sherlock Holmes at Scotland Yard. I'll figure out exactly what two Toothpaste I ate when's the last time I picked out my ass hairs within seconds of looking at that clue. Crane saves me and in the awkward car ride back home, I'm forced to agree with everything he spews from the incel manifesto while telling him I was the person who chained up the 50 molester moons stacked on top of each other. After having to search up the definition of Kalis, I come to the realization I have another weapon in my arsenal when describing politicians as I'm given a deadline to find the culprit by the end of the night. No, 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 it's fine. I've only been awake for two straight days. I'm sure I won't collapse on the spot, you obstacle from Box Run. We get to the underground torture chamber every good cop needs, away from any surveillance systems and oversight, as we see the average TCLR subscriber making use of the chamber's primary objectives and abusing his privileges. I come in with the assertive authority met by his sarcasm. That's pretty good, not gonna lie. TCLR stamp of approval. He tells me he hasn't killed anyone, to which I respond that he's lying, before he comes up with a valid counter. He gives me the smug look and his blue beard is about to re-enter, Crane tells him to let me cook. I asked him why he was a toads and another non-response enrages me. He's reaching for a weapon! I show him a photo of Snow and with her neck being visible from under her chin, it leaves D with a feeling of disgust as it lowers his resolve. As I let him cook, he mentions his brother and he's loyal, I'll give him that, before Crane brings his belongings. Before I can check them out, however, he lets me know he wants to try that Chinese woman foot reduction thing they used to do back when they had an emperor. He refuses to answer my question, so I go take a look at his belongings. A cigar, a bottle of whiskey, and a large wad of cash. This can only lead me to the conclusion that he was engaging in prostitution with a nicotine addict, but before I give him 50 to life for sleeping with the hooker, I decide to give him one last sip of whiskey, speeding up his inevitable liver failure as it's trying to carry a 700 pound frame, hopefully making this world a better place. I ask questions again with him hopefully drunk now and asking what he wanted from Faith's apartment. Sweet girl like her. He cuts me off, letting me know that half the city ran through her both Monday and Faith. 
table. Her shit's looking like tough after metal bending out of that trap they put her in. He lets us in on his bus, but after prying more, he utilizes his right to remain silent. After asking him what the money is going to be used for, I quickly seize it for the good of the state because everyone knows laundries are another code for hard drugs that can get you 20 years minimum like Adderall or weed. Ew. Feel dirty for even saying those words. Crane tells me I can't just do that, but I tell him I'm a cop, to which he understands. Apparently, this two balls for a snowman and his brother are dripping with Riz as he tells me they double dipped in her, and just as he's getting to the juicy bits, Bluebeard comes in and says, not in my Christian household, as he begins laying the beat down on Tweedle, dumbass, and I can't lie, he performs it masterfully. The technique is on point. The bruises are minimal, and I'm forced to intervene, else he takes my spot as the chief defender of justice. After showing him the proper protocol for dealing with a minority who raises their hands in the air. What's going on down here? Snow. Snow? Snow chews me out for abusing a prisoner like that, but I lie straight to her face, closing the pearly white gates of heaven to me forever. I didn't lay a hand on her. Apparently they found the body. It was TJ, of course, the number one detective on the job, as I'm tasked with looking over the body and getting all the details from TJ. Snow feels responsible because the body was cosplaying her, but I assure her it was just an imposter. Among Us? I tell her we keep doing our jobs, but she wants a career change in the middle of the case. Not exactly perfect timing, Snow, until my sympathy is exposed and our relationship can never be the same again. I can choose who I want to converse with first before my boy, who's always available and ready, a true TCLR subscriber, ready for any challenges life might throw at him. I take note of Snow's perfume to use in conjunction with my sex doll later, before I realize Crane's stomach is going through a super colossal eruption right now. Anyways, time for my episodic tarot card reading. First thing already happened is Snow hit the dagger right through Bigby's heart, leaving him with nothing but his left hand for the foreseeable future. I'm apparently going to marry Omega from that wolf movie Under the Moonlight with Mr. Krabs as our pasture. Finally, Gandalf the Grey is going to show up and expose everything in due time, allowing me to rest easy knowing I got the expert criminal catcher on the case. I catch Mr. Toad red-handed watching Froggy porn with his son, trying to show him the right moves for Froggy style, but apparently it was my profile they were checking out as my porn career career is growing exponentially, even pleasing other species with my specific fetishes. TJ tells me he was swimming under a river and went under when he heard footsteps until they dropped a body before asking if I can really read minds. To which I respond, I can tell what he's thinking right now and use the fact I know what every teenage boy dreams of all days being titties and he comes clean, that he didn't actually stay under the entire time. And as his father starts yelling at him, I tell him he isn't in trouble. Doc Alley's note. Not this time, Toad. Toad might be the dad, but I'm your daddy. Don't ever forget it, bitch. I let him go after, since a dumbass like him has exhausted his capacity for thought, doubly so being a frog. As Snow takes me to take a look at the body, but before I decide to rub the lamp, because even genies need to be pleasured every once in a while, before trying my luck with the mirror again, I ask to peep through what Toad's been watching. It, hey, what do you know? It was the biggest porn stars followed by my own work. He tells me to rhyme next time, to which I oblige. Mirror, mirror, while my toes have fungus, show me the biggest chungus among us. Snow is telling Buffkin to investigate the richest man in New York, Bluebeard. What? What? But my corruption! Who else is going to be giving me five figures for turning a blind eye every time he does something ethically wrong and illegal like slavery and the like? No. This isn't how you're supposed to play the game. We go to the wishing well chamber where I commence my investigation. To gauge whether Snow has a gag reflex and is worth my time, I stick my entire fist in there, leaving me pleasantly surprised. However, it seems opening her jaw leaves her uncomfortable, meaning we'll have to deal with less circumferential room than I'm used to. A problem for the average TCLR subscriber. I found exclusive footage of two TCLR subscribers duking it out. As you can see here, when these two fight, tectonic plates shift, and they even start flying, as you can observe. So Subscribe and hit the bell to not only get a chiseled Greek god body and six inches where it matters, but to, more importantly, not miss out on future content. Continuing my analysis, she tried offing herself, however, picked the wrong pole of the body, and it seems she was an avid hero her heroine. Burn the witch, fill her with bricks of crack, and send it on the ops' doorstep. Let him know New York is a pristine, proper crack. 
enjoying neighborhood. She's clutching onto something as Snow makes a wrong observation, but it's a good thing we got Buffkin on the case and unraveling her hands we find. It, well, it appears someone decided to pick a fight with the Powerpuff Girls on a bad day. I find a brooch that Snow doesn't wear, and if even Buffkin has no idea what that symbol is, I deduce we're dealing with a master of disguise, narrowing down the options to Moriarty, fake ass from Walking Whatever. Dead Season 2 on crack, or Johnny Sins. After figuring out the victim wasn't using government-issued drugs, Snow tries to sneak in a new law, but Buffkin hits us with that actually isn't illegal. So we somehow have a black market for glamour, which isn't illegal. Why is that the case? Well, I assume it's because anyone that tries is given a visit by Bigby flanked by these two balls of porridge. And I read their Miranda rights while the other two hit him with the lead pipe pillow tag team duo. We find an extra button on fake Snow's blouse and as I get to opening her coat, Snow takes that precious, joyous milestone away from me. After hearing a woman started stripping, Crane quickly ran down from his hourly incel.com poll browsing to offer us some assistance. The mysterious lady is wearing some sort of pink lingerie and Miss Snow, I need you to strip down to your underwear immediately or I'm giving you 20 years for impeding police activity. I'm just trying to see if the clothes are exact. They're not. That isn't good enough, Miss Snow. I'm going to need a visual confirmation. I find Snow's perfume in the pocket, exposing my stocking tendencies, but there seems to be a more dangerous one on the loose, using the glamour to fulfill their fantasies. I find some sort of voodoo doll on the person, and after shaking it, I think there's some candy inside, and to get to the forbidden Skittles, I unlock the code. But it's only a locket of hair and a picture of Snow White. The locket appears to be from Snow herself, giving me a pretty good idea of who did this. Someone obsessed with Snow to the point of stalking, close enough to her person to grab a locket of hair without her noticing while having the ability to use their power to corruption counter any investigation into their own misdeeds. I'm the last person I would have suspected, but I was looking for me all the time. While we're not looking, however, the Kardashians quickly come through and give on-demand plastic surgery to hide any evidence. Everyone is gobsmacked, zoomer knuckled, really the more appropriate term at the evident troll, but knowing they're a frequent redditor narrows down the pool of suspects considerably. Crane, quickly, check the database for everyone maidenless over the past five years who hasn't touched grass in four. We find out it's Holly's sister, Lily, from last episode who's been stuck at the cigarette shop for weeks. Crane acts sussy-wussy and as we're going to inform Holly of her jeans failure to survive, Crane implores Snow not to leave because the ops might still be spinning the block as we speak, but with me having the final say, I let Snow come in exchange for her ignoring the crimes I've committed over the past day. Which comes in handy almost immediately as we get to the trip trap where the guys who I absolutely maimed last episode and the hun from the purple dragons is sitting there with Captain John Cena, Chinese variant, talking shit behind my back. After I walk in, Jack's next phrase shows me he's going to be going goblin mode soon enough. Come on, Holly. I need entertainment. This'll do. Holly hides the drink so I don't break her cups again, and Jack tries to get on my good side, but without any cash or credit, he's just wasting his time. They let us know that the body we found that wasn't supposed to be brought up has made its way to a high school clique, and from there, we couldn't stop its spread. The poster of this information seemed to be Tweedalina. Brain released my prisoner. I, I mean, the suspect I was treating with every article of the Geneva Suggest Convention in mind. Tweedledee said you arrested him for no earthly reason kept him locked in the cellar all fucking night. Before telling me I broke my legislative duties, to which I let him know what I think of those duties and preemptively record the sequel to Two Girls, One Cup for the channel, using my excrement as a special guest, of course. Holly tells Jack to shut up as he goes. You guys said you wanted to fight this bitch and his pants stinky with a small peepee and all that, but the second I walk in, they aren't about that life. He fucking maimed you. Aren't you pissed? Me personally, I wouldn't take this level of disrespect. The other's reason that they aren't scared, they're just tired of stepping up to my big steppers, and as I'm trying to explain the situation that I came to explain, Jack keeps mouthing off. You know what? It's fine. Let him cook. Dead. And shit, Gren's sister. Holly's sister. Holly's sister has been missing for what? A few days now? And we haven't heard word one about it from anyone. Actually, have there been any updates? Yeah, the troll is dead. Gone. Left this plane of existence. Never gonna find out how One Piece ends. Sorry. 
Boy, I sure walked into that one. The others complain how Snow is alive as if they want her to off herself to make things fair. And then he continues to complain how I was nowhere to be seen when they reported it. As if I make the damn decisions of who I do and don't investigate. Listen, maybe you should have paid Crane and Snow the entrance fee so I could get the investigation started. Ever think of that? Holly breaks the bottle, understandable considering her sister's been off. She tells us to piss off and how it should have been her, not the sister, which seems stupid to comprehend, honestly. Skill dip, get good new, GGEs. But as we get going, Snow goes, hold up, let me cook, and gives an important piece of evidence to Holly, getting her to see reason before telling Gren to piss off. Only a matter of time before she switched to the winning side. Sorry, bro, it happens. It happens. It happens. She lets us know she got swept up in the city and was hooking to pay off debts, and the only people she eventually ended up owing was the pudding and pie. And this is where my blood begins to boil. He kept her under their thumb with bullshit fees from Georgie the scumbag and trapping Holly's sister. I'm so sick of these people! We tell her she can take the body as I'm preparing to go down to Buddy Georgie, give him some of that Derek Chauvinism, and Snow calls me a good boy. Even though she found out I maimed a guy last episode, she's impressed I limited it to just that. I get to the strip club where I'm greeted by... God damn, I could fit pilfered diamonds from unequal trade agreements imposed on the Congo itself with that dump truck. Georgie apparently doesn't like to be disturbed when he's cooking and... It'll be fine. I have a way with people. <laughs> so I've heard. As you can see, she's already flooded, giving me the Wizard of Oz phase invented by Miles Morales in an attempt to attract a mate. Before we continue, we're approaching a scene with some titties bouncing around, which would normally get me demonetized and I'd have to censor it. However, I can apparently show them for educational purposes, so it's time for an anatomy lesson, folks. The mammary glands, or titties, are meant to nourish newborns, which start production after pregnancy occurs, causing lactin to be secreted from the hypothalamus, engaging in milk production a few days after the newborn has been released. I get to Georgie who points out my brilliant deductive skills before trying to bribe me with a hooker, shocking me to think I could be bribed with anything other than cold hard cash, before saying, I'm not here for that. Ooh, I'm not here for that. <laughs> oh, just stopped in for the chips then. <laughs> Wait. It was probably when EDP was playing the night he thought he was gonna get that minor, thinking it was some brilliant excuse. If I say cupcake, they can't do shit. He tells me the Oracle prophesized my arrival before letting him know it's illegal to impersonate another fable like Lily was doing, to which he tells me to show him the law, not understanding that I am the law, and it can be yours too for three small monthly payments of $9.99.99. He says I'm full of shit before spitting on my Tims, and that's when my temper broke. I show him the hair of snow and calls me a lot of Fucked up people in Fable Town. Like who? Try looking in the mirror. Memory glands also have cosmetic appeal as they come in different shapes and sizes depending on the genes passed down to you from. That's it, you fedora wearing Discord mod. You're gonna whip me. Go ahead. He's reaching for a weapon. Fortunately, the only casualty is the stereo until this Hans Mindfjell looking mother. Oh, would you? Would you look at that? His name actually is Hans. After saying he doesn't have a name of the clientele to track down Lily's latest abuser, Hans pipes in about the damn death note they've been keeping, enraging Georgie. Now it's time to get those book answers one way or another. What's this? An unlicensed music device? There's gonna be a fee for that. Cigarette bucks? Not in my New York. There's a major fee for that. You got a license for that there TV? Nope. Well, that's another fine there. A wah? Another fee for that as well. Hey, there's a safe. He doesn't give me the key though, and I punish his obstruction of justice with an obstruction of his colon. Apparently the next hit gets a charge? Boy, if you don't shut up and give me the key, you getting charged with assault on an officer. I am very good at punching myself in the face. Massive stereo box in this place of worship? You better believe there's a fee for that. This is a dance club. What the hell am I supposed to do tonight while the girls are on stage? Harmonica, kazoo, whistle a happy tune, fucking unbelievable. The last entry for Lily is Mr. Smith, a fake name unsurprisingly. He says he's gonna call my superiors as if that's ever stopped anyone. As I rob him in plain sight before smoking the Georgie fee pack, I decide, you know what, I do want a taste, and walk in on the Hooters star employee who used to be the Little Mermaid? You telling me you went from starfish suckling your bosom to any manner of fairy tale creatures? Who can work 20 hours at a minimum wage job? She bought her legs, probably why she's in debt in the first place, knowing Georgie that loan's got 25% monthly interest. I need to know about one of Lily's uh, clients. Calling himself Mr. Smith, a 
apparently. We can't talk about work. This is a murder case. I mean, can't. These lips are sealed. Wait a minute! That's what Faith said last episode. Which means... She's trying to obstruct justice? Listen, give me this man's name or you're getting shipped off to a seafood-themed episode of Hell's Kitchen. She figures her best chance at life is bribery of the sexual variant, to which I happily oblige in 150. Uh, doesn't that seem a little che- I, I mean, I, listen, I'm not exactly a strip club nut buster, but you'd assume you can jack up those prices a little. No matter, this one's on the marshmallow man. She gives me a key to the open arms room 204, not the 207 I need, but she's done enough. I get to an officer who evidently caught this woman speeding five points above the speed limit and trapping her with either a brief stint in jail or some free favors on the house before walking into every $20 a night motel I've ever been to. They must accept Monopoly money, cause no no way anyone's paying $35 a night to sleep at a hotel that would be perfect for a Gordon Ramsay show. I ring the bell and... Beauty? Dear Diary, Jackpot. Unfortunately, she only works the front desk to pay rent, although she doesn't tell Beast cause he'd get mad. I'd give this relationship another two years at best. I tell her someone else has been isis and after grilling her for a few minutes about the troll walking in, Smith John Johnson's representing a much larger share of the clientele than them in the actual population. And even how she found a snow lookalike who gave her the cold shoulder, which was pretty rude, no need to be ashamed of getting used like a vaccine syringe, thrown away immediately after use, but to each their own. The reason she was mentioned by Tweedle was cause he gave her a loan that would make loan sharks guilty, but not the crooked man, and I'm going to assume they couldn't downgrade because only an idiot takes loans to live above their means, right? Right? That's called foreshadowing. I'm up to investigate and she tags along to make sure she isn't fired for letting a cop sniff around the obviously illegal motel business model. She takes the time to ask if she has to be included in the report at a direct shot at my honor. You dare insinuate I leave out details of the case? Of course not. This can go one of two ways. Beauty, wife to Beast, showed me upstairs of a place she works at trying to stop Beast from finding out. Or the woman who gave me a blowjob showed me upstairs. Choice is yours. I check room 207 which isn't my room, leaving Beauty enraged, although a quick reminder of the Britney Griner situation and how inspired that made me feel quickly shut her up until... Big B? How could you do this to me? Ah, don't worry, it's all good. Beauty will explain everything. I'm helping him, that's all. I'll bet! I try getting him to calm down, but he swings first as I dog walk the inferior beast. Oh no, he's actually reaching for a weapon. After taking his weapon, knocking him out, I hit him when he's down, pleasing my predecessors. He then asks me how attackers could topple castles in the medieval age with such large walls surrounding them, to which I deem a demonstration most fitting. After using him as dental floss, I leave beauty to deal with the inferior mammal on the food chain as I get to the damn reenactment of the Red Wedding. I match the flower to the bed, confirming my suspicions before reading a cute Snow White book. Here she is flexing her drip on the gram. Someone sent her an apple for her to show off for the gram. Uh oh. It seems she ended up watching the live action Death Note she's not waking up for days. Although with the sticky notes, I wouldn't be surprised if this was a cop manual in 2022. We figure out that the culprit is not into dummy mommies, consolidating our resolve to find this disgusting individual. The person has also ripped up the dress and with his violence and domination, as well as the fact that they paid for a hooker, it's most definitely an incel.com poster. Although at the end of the day, Georgie is the real predator. Fuck that motherfucker. Beauty and Brands are mutually exclusive in this situation as she gives me jack all info before finding someone who accidentally purchased a dark red apple. Unable to take more than a bite from that monstrosity. God bless his soul, whoever they are. This person must have some weird snow fetish akin to a brony, so we've at least discovered another layer to the degeneracy platform. But look who's got mail. All right, the man is a stalker as he pictures snow looking off into the distance, getting ready to drop the hardest track since Drake and 21 tag team that shit. A picture of Bigby looking drippy, my goodness that's a keeper instagram profile pic right there before finally we get to the culprit what is it it's <gasps> crane oh oh no mirror look out <laughs> Check out some of my other content linked in the pinned comment down below as we complete the second episode of Wolf Among Us as the story heats up. Apparently my incel comments weren't too far off after all. If you want to see episode 3, let me know down below in the comments and I'll see you all in the next video. Peace.
The history of YouTube over the last six years has been tumultuous, rough, and at times unbearable. But through it all, our Grand Secretariat made sure to steer us on the path to salvation. Who can forget the legendary seven seconds or less swearing massacre of 2022, the fabled dislike button riots of 2021, the numerous criminals against the state relocated to humane conditions, might I add, in Siberia, and best of all, leading us through the exalted demonetization civil war of 2016. I salute you, comrade, wherever you go next, just revel in the realization you made the Uvia Tubian a better place. Is she gone? Perfect. De-Stalinization it is. Surely the new YouTube CEO is at least somewhat better. <laughs> right? Right? Done. Just in case you were all wondering, I played a Boondocks clip in my last video and it got demonetized. The ops shot it up the second it entered the hood, right as I finished uploading it. I mean, fair enough, there was swearing in the first seven seconds, but then in this video, I showed a lactating nipple, full on no sensor, a mammary gland, a female titty, and it's still up. I'm just after. In any case, Wolf Among Us episode three on crack continues today where we engage in a wild goose chase for Crane, who's wanted for harassment of the sexual variant in the workplace, a case a cop as brutal and corrupt as myself would normally throw out the window. But the victim is my boss and knows of my abuse of power, so I kinda have to take him in today, unfortunately. Let's go smoke some crack off. Well, not the powdered stuff, certainly. This guy would huff the entire brick by just sniffling. I mean, bro could probably track the delivery driver with just his nose. Family tree must look like a recycling logo with that genetic malformation. And play The Wolf Among Us, episode three on crack. I stare at what looks like a photo of insert billionaire here with a miner they stole off of Jeffrey Epstein before he tragically passed away by bashing his own head against a wall before proceeding to shoot himself in the back five times. Preparing to give Crane the fair sentence of 20 to life for stealing my hoe. Beauty is disgusted, and this is someone who got her back Mortal Kombat finishered by a wildebeest, so you know Crane messed up. Beast here doing absolutely nothing, going, What happened? Boy, if you don't shut your <laughs> ass up, I'll plant a hundred pounds of Columbia's finest in your car. Just try me. Beast tells me Snow's with Holly and Buckingham Bridge, which sounds like the Queen's funeral is commencing shortly. Again? Beauty informs me Snow is going to be 100 times more freaked out than I was because, how do I say this while still keeping the money? Uh, Snow was getting wrapped by the seven little dwarfs down in 8 Mile. You went to Cranbrook, that's a private school! I get to the funeral and Snow gives me the not now I'm in a call as I patiently wait to tell her dad is wrestling with the maid. But MLK I is spitting though, giving hey. us a proper send off to Black History Month as I decide to let her cook and go talk to Prince Lawrence. Who seems angry Lily is receiving a funeral while Faith is... Bro, you can literally organize one yourself. I mean, if you don't get your ass up and bury her yourself instead of feeling sorry. After hearing him flex to make himself feel better, I go and read the memorabilia, observing how based and red-pilled of a gamer Lily was, a big fan of Skyrim, while I read her best moments on the Xbox Live mic. Now, for obvious reasons, I can't say what was written, but it was akin to... Snow completes her sermon as Holly engages in ape mode. I thought you were a troll, not a beauty turn-on. She gets mad, even though I'm about to announce the killer, but I let her go off because these 5 to 10 for assaulting an officer are rated E for everyone, just try me. Unfortunately, she's too smart to fall for my master bait as she believes I threw her sister down the witching well, which, oh god, Crane. You are to blame for this unpleasant. He destroyed the evidence. That's my job. Ah! It should have been me. I'm almost inclined to make him my boy with his adept mastery of skirting the Bill of Rights, a TCLR classic. Mr. Tripped on a mine while we were running out of Afghanistan asks why I'm not out stopping bombshells to thoroughly investigate the smell of marijuana coming out of their bras. Or better yet, legally spin the block on my ops. We're all black.
Finally, I announce who murdered her sister. <laughs> Come on now, Big B, it's official Fable Town business. But I've learned from the Black Lives Matter riots and rally the people to my side against authority, allowing me to tell on Crane without repercussions. Snow decides to stop me and tells everyone to go back to the funeral. You heard her, boys. Time to give Crane a proper send-off. Snow's sympathies fall on deaf ears as this bitch, sorry, this respectable, empowered woman throws me under the bus. What do you say fuck me for? I found out who literally literally blew your sister's back out right after blowing your sister's back out and you want to blame me? Snow wants some sort of evidence. Wait, I actually need that? I thought it was an opt-in kind of thing. So I start lying and telling her every weapon I've learned over the years. He was reaching for a weapon, he refused to cooperate, he was going 58 in a 55. I even listed my sources. Until I realize, wait a minute, I'm in the right this time and exhibit the photo of Crane. Ariel comes and asks for Snow since this is a really important moment in a troll's funeral and I give her the go-ahead to milk lol cows with the other trolls for one final time before sending off Lily, but it does turn out to be a ploy by the little mermaid to enlarge my little man until she also gets called over, leaving me all alone waiting. Constable? Wait, 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 easy now, girl. <laughs> Imagine someone threatening you like, Constable? <laughs> Anytime a British person threatens you, it just sounds like they're messing around. I'm gonna get my aprilla out and do burnouts on your front lawn, and then I'm gonna chuck mud bombs at your nan's windows, you silly bastard. Drive by in what? You're gonna come at me with one of these? Oi! Oi, I see him! Oh, block for the glory of the king! They get mad at my impoliteness, wanting a, how do you do, strange, since we already know their EDP-like frames are suffering heavily from numerous diseases. What diseases exactly, you may ask? Well, just check WebMD and pick something they probably have it after roasting them telling them their frames make the leaning tower of pisa's look like a sound stable structure which passes all safety requirements i tell the r slash neckbeard mascots to piss off and they tell me to stop going after crane implicating themselves and as i ask another question let's take a little vacation is all don't even have to go anywhere just sit in your office and whisper. I mean, it's crazy. What? We finish each other. Holly sees this Disney XD spectacle going on, and I have to think quick. Wait a minute. I'm a cop! <laughs> I'll just lie and say yes very well, with no intention of actually honoring our agreement. The silly putties make a grand show of it and start flaming everybody in sight as Ben 10 got a new alien monster while I was gone. The loud hot Cheetos consumer. Now, to be fair, the twins were about to leave, so we can easily de-escalate the situation. Surely you won't charge two idiots with shotguns. Yeah, let's spare all the fuss. It's just a dead off. YouTube, I want my money. He one-taps Holly and is about to save his brother, but I intervene to seize his weapon as my teammate throws and feeds the enemy, who shoots me before they both make their escape. In all honesty, we could probably take a nap or two and catch up to them before they can club penguin waddle a hundred feet, but they're armed, so we kind of have to let them escape. Notice how twice now these idiots charged a guy with a shotgun. You would think this was Ohio 20 years after the government spilt cyanide and mustard gas into the river, leading Ohioans to evolve into this. I get patched up by the doctor as Snow gives me the exposition. Dr. Swinehart was appointed Fabletown physician for a reason. What? He's a doctor? My apologies, I thought he was Mr. Clean. Everyone else made it out as fine as can be expected, although their long-term outlook is grim considering natural selection is undefeated. Snow gets a call telling me the town is beginning to find out there was a shootout on Buckingham Bridge. Color my nipples purple, cause I for one am shocked they found out so quick. Crane smashed the magic mirror last episode after stalking me and finding out that I found out about his furry fetish while my boy Buffkin was drinking in the bleachers. Being unfathomably basic as usual. All we have to do is wait for him to repair the mirror, but Snow is having her doubts that Crane would kill prostitute, excuse me, female companions, and what doesn't make sense is why kill Faith. She ain't do nothing. Can I, um, ask you a question? It's kind of personal. To which I reply, sure, trying my absolute hardest to keep my mast from setting sail in vain, might I add. But it was all for naught as Snow asks if I feel a sense of primal urge when things go wrong, like an oonga boonga mechanism activates in my brain. Kind of like when degenerates go, ahuga when they see feet. Scary! 
but instead with violence and blood and such. This many videos and it took you this long to figure it out? Buffkin saves me from testifying in Nuremberg and tells us Crane took a piece of the mirror with him. Crane might want to rap Snow, but Buffkin actually dropped some bars against her. He had to have left something that tells us where he's going. He's a neat freak, but he was never that smart. Smart enough to take a piece of the mirror. Snow snaps at him and he looks sad, so I go and talk to him and he lets us in on a secret. Crane's going to visit his witch, the one who made his snow glamours, presumably. Until I more importantly tell him it wasn't his fault, even though it was. Never mind, he's got a point here. His three foot frame wouldn't have done shit against Crane, so I take pity on him and make sure this situation never repeats itself by helping Buffkin become an average TCLR subscriber. I quickly whip out the phone and get Buffkin to subscribe immediately allowing him to grow four feet with another two and a half on the way as his body enters metamorphosis getting ready to increase his bald man to unrealistic proportions he's ready for a rematch with crane one where a single rip of his shirt exposing his abs to crane is alone to vanquish him from reality completely and even erasing him from people's memories with the thoroughness of his destruction whose destruction Exactly. Leave a like and subscribe to not only be able to watch a full-on marathon of Season 8 of Game of Thrones, but to, more importantly, not miss out on future content. I try opening the drawer, but it's locked before Snow gives me the police secret code, roughly translating to cameras are off, cripple every nerve in his body, as we find a book, perusing the catalog until we get to a page torn out and require Buffkin's expertise. It's a ring, at least. Brilliant. My boy is a Sherlock replica. It must be this witch he is going to see. Wait, what witch? Buffkin overheard Crane set up a meeting with a witch. Well, yes, it sounded like the one he got his, uh, you glamours from. It must be about this ring. Why not mention this before? No one asked me. Buffkin! <laughs> The meeting is at 2 a.m. tonight before Bluebeard and his perfect jawline blast through. Bluebeard presses us for answers, but me and Snow keep him in the dark, as is the logical maneuver in this circumstance. The only thing we know is that Crane's going to see a witch at 2 o'clock. A.M. or P.M.? A.M. Odin has it's spoken. Welcome to the investigation, Bluebeard. After Buffkin's 11th commandment, we let Bluebeard in on the plan as he lets loose a flurry of words that would make feminists everywhere gag as he speedruns losing his Twitter account with various kitchen, dishwasher, baby maker, the Iranians were right. We conclude we at least have some idea of what's going on and a time frame as Buffkin makes sure we know this was all his doing, of course. Snow tells me to go to Holly's place first, but Bluebeard is wondering what the Tweedles have to do with this ploy as the two of them begin debating the Tweedles' intelligence. After trying to play Peacemaker, Bluebeard is going to scour Crane's apartment as we get to the greatest moment of this episode. What? You can't just go up there. And why the hell not? We already looked for the key, remember? I don't know where it is. Then I'll pick the blasted lock! Wait a minute. Then I'll pick the blasted lock! Then I'll pick the blasted lock! Pick a lock, right? Then I'll pick the blasted lock. Well, you, you know, Urban. After telling us he's not gonna sniff Crane's panties, that's good enough for me, as his next point seals the deal. We can't just let Bluebeard run amok in Crane's place. We have to find the witch, Bluebeard, since that's where he's going. Or oh, the sniveling weasel chickened out. Never went anywhere and is upstairs right now in his pitiful penthouse, crafting a fort out of couch cushions. Knowing this is a telltale game, I eeny meeny miny mow it and go to the Tweedles first while Lee goes to Crane's apartment. I get to the office where Flycatcher is sucking me off as I ask for the Tweedles, who are shockingly not here. He started working for them after Crane fired him to increase company profits and as I ask to see the Tweedles' office. After unlocking the door, I tell him I either search the place or hit myself with a lead pipe, giving him 20 to life for assault on an officer. I look through their file cabinet where it seems a money embezzlement scheme is being run as 
what are these prices? We have my college loan being figured out as a quick math problem on top, an actual dinosaur fossil considering the price, and the original Bible being sold to Crane and he had the audacity to ask them to find a compromising photo of faith. After looking at a debt that would make Greece look like a bastion of financial stability, we get some fan service for comic readers. Another target for their slave trade operations. <laughs> I love how they have a three-step program to turn beauty into a female companion. Excuse me, Suze. I mean, Neil. Bugcatcher tells me that they aren't that bad and everyone deserves a chance at redemption and Stalin wasn't that bad, all things considered. After noticing their fluent mastery of the pen and prescribing them with permanent trips on the short bus, Bugcatcher continues with his tanky rhetoric. Not everything people say is true. They're good people. They shot up Lily's funeral because they're hitmen. They made Columbine look like a nerf war. This man really trying to play the free my boy he ain't do nothing wrong card when it turns out that boy was using these lyrics as a daily to-do list. Home and base, home and base, robbery. After feeling bad, it turns out I've opened his eyes and he lets me into their secret passageway out back, the VIP section. I walk in cautiously, half expecting to meet Bill Gates, Jeffrey Epstein, an African prince, and Fidel Castro surrounded by a bunch of 13-year-olds. But it turns out this is just their smuggling operation. Crane was sending money to the crooked man through the lucky pawn or something as I quickly seize the money for closer inspection later. A butcher is deciding to jump into the coffee business, a foreshadowing of things to come next video as fly Catcher continues with this episode's theme of fan service for the comics. I find a container with Snow's hair and reverse engineer the process to track down the person it was meant for. Auntie Greenleaf. God, I'm such a good detective. Without an address, unfortunately, I call up Snow to see if she knows what's up, but she'll get my boy Buffkin on the job, and I decide to let her know Crane's been embezzling from Fabletown to feed his fetish. Now, I've personally never stolen my boss's credit card to sign up to Fart Furry Fetish Monthly, so I wouldn't know the punishments surrounding that crime. But since it wasn't a subscription to Furry's magazine, I don't think we can get him with Firing Squad. I decide to go to Crane's apartment next because I don't trust Jagoff Lee trying to impersonate the real Blessed One. I get to his apartment where Buffkin tells me that Bluebeard burned everything. Oh no. The cunning, sexy, jawline abuser planted a trap, swiping Buffkin's phone and unsubscribing, leaving him powerless against Bluebeard. That right there is worth firing squad at least. We can't use anything here, so I tell Buffkin to track down Auntie Greenleaf as I make my way to the trip trap. I politely knock and... Read the sign! I sure hope this fine establishment's papers are in order. Hey, look, Woody, it's the sheriff. Gren wants a drink, although it apparently combines with whatever medication he's on to create bleach in his gut. Woody tells me Holly is asleep in the back as the doctor gave them ambrosia, which Gren lets us know it gives a very nice high if you resist the melatonin signals. Before he ruthlessly puts down Woody. Yes, he did. Certainly did. Well, let me tell you something. I haven't felt this good in a long time, fat boy. That one there was a violation. Me personally, I wouldn't take. <laughs> okay, that was uncalled for. <laughs> Come on, man. It's not even that funny. I mean, <laughs> eventually I play along with Gran and we give out a toast to the dead. They start arguing and then fist fighting as I watch to see who wins. But before I can place any bets, they stop as Gren tells me the news. Woody, not satisfied with cutting down trees with his axe, has been using his other tools on Holly's sister behind Holly's back, who only found out after going through her shit. What could you have possibly left to implicate yourself, Woody? Like, how did you leave a DNA test with your semen? Perhaps you decided to take a picture of yourself to commemorate the occasion? Now, I'm assuming he was a paying customer for this companion, considering the fact I don't remember seeing him on the Wizards of Waverly Place. Nor does he look like he freed the slaves with Abe Rizzler Lincoln. Nor does he look like he has a high level account on Rizzard 101. After laughing and pointing at how he had to pay money to get any action, he storms away. Gren, after promising to help me, says he doesn't know shit and passes out as I decide to sneak into Holly's room. 
If I wasn't a police officer, I'd be in a very difficult predicament. I end up waking her up as she groggily has me reconsidering my story choices and whether I care about the strains, the one at the bottom. I care about the ones who can pay, unless they're black. I find the initials and the address for Auntie Greenleaf as Snow calls me up and I tell her to meet me outside her apartment and can't help but go, Was a good doggy? Me and Snow get there as she gives me command of this operation. This is Sparta! Don't be fooled by her, Snow. This is obviously a lolly. Worst crane, bitch. I'm... <laughs> if you don't calm your rah, 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 car starting in negative 20 degree weather ass up and tell me where Crane is. After me and Snow play good cup, bad cup, we learn the girl is named Rachel and ask if she's seen a tall, skinny, pale man running about, perhaps browsing incel.com on his phone. But she can only respond with an art teacher. I'm fairly certain caught her hubby getting lovey with another dovey. I tell her I don't care about the law. Let me search here, getting 20 to life for pissing me off. I scout around the premises, finding an antique music player. Big band or classical? Honky tonk. We have a suspect. She's armed, dangerous, and on perk 35, so I'm gonna need backup. Over. We find a giant tree your mom used to carve trinkets out of, like, glamours, perhaps of unsuspecting women, and I find the butcher. Yes! I knew that man was gonna be important. Who is he? What does he do? Is this coffee enough to challenge Nescafe? So many questions that need answering. God damn it. I shouldn't say that. We don't find anything, so we're on our way out. Aha! A primitive butt plug. Her reaction to my finding confirms my suspicions as I try to turn it on. And she goes ballistic. That's no child underneath that disguise. I get to opening it while Snow holds back the hostage, I, I mean suspect, and I open it only to find she was Auntie Greenleaf all along. Might have gotten away with it too, if it wasn't for these black- Hurts when you do it that fast. Betcha it doesn't hurt more than this. <coughs> After roughing up an innocent civilian a bit, I now go ballistic on her, telling her she's aiding a murderer. You might want to check your facts on that. Crap, she knows the law. She's afraid of powers beyond our pathetic authority. Ah, god damn it, big pharma's behind this, aren't they? Snow breaks and says, all right, watch this, and lists a bunch of bogus charges, might I add, which I have no idea what they mean. I'm an officer of the law, after all. How am I supposed to know what any of this jargon she's blabbering on about means? As she says we're destroying the tree she uses to make her glamour, causing Auntie to break. She makes some very good points, and the old hag was wasting our time. I'm with you. Burn down her livelihood that helps the less fortunate fables. You think I like being the old woman in these stories? You're literally a glamour maker. Just disguise yourself as Snow. I tell Snow I can't do this. There are people we'd be banishing to the farm. Bigby, this is an order. The oh, fuck do you think you are? But before I show Snow the difference between being a dog and having that dog in me, Auntie breaks and tells us Crane went to the pudding and pie and took the magic ring from earlier with him, which acts as Wonder Woman's lasso, but it's lost its power decades ago. Snow is still looking for blood though and tells me to burn down the tree, but I tell her to do it herself and walk out as Snow and Greenleaf exchange more words before we make our way to the club. Crane's car is here as I fart and look at Snow until she realizes. I get into the kazoo player on the brick phone, throwing insults left and right. He's frying my ass. Punch. We find Crane and push past him as he shows us the definition of foreshadowing. Before I catch Crane red-handed assaulting a prost- A companion. I place Crane under arrest without any actual bullshit charges this time as he begins trying to explain to me how it couldn't have been. Slaps. Uh. He tries getting the ring to work looking like he's using the force to lift up a TV remote or something. My lips are sealed. That's like the seventh time they've said that. That's gotta be code for something. Crane gives up shortly after as he tries pleading how he didn't do it before he decides this is the best time to profess his love in front of Snow. Before Snow catches strays right after, professing his love and roasting a girl he's into in the same sentence, a true inceller, I found your commander in chief. Snow shockingly strikes him down before taking pity on him and saying he probably didn't do it. And I say, fine, we still got him for home invasion, assaulting a hooker, robbery, illegal glamour smuggling, possession of a deadly weapon, embezzling, and attacking me with a deadly weapon.
Not to mention he probably played that Harry Potter game where he got his ass for life in the court of public opinion. Even considering we're in America and have to drop the deadly weapons charge, that's still enough to get him for life at least. Now, I guess we know who's in charge, Sheriff. Sometimes it's fuzzy. Unless you want to see me get fuzzy, you better keep your leash away, Snow. You think you have what it takes to run that office? I made sacrifices. I'm sure you sacrificed a lot when you decided to smuggle less money out of Fable Town than you normally would do out of the goodness of your heart. He keeps talking and I give him a nose job free of charge before what I can only assume to be abuse of a prisoner. He starts blaming woman for his permanent membership in Maidenless Anonymous as Snow. What you see, you little shit? Nothing, father. It appears someone wants to park close to the strip club. And that's okay, we can just go the other way. Ah, crap, it's probably the FBI. Well, seems my past crimes have finally caught up with me. I'll see you all in next week's video straight from Nuremberg, Germany. Karen Halloween variant comes out of the car along with her two Snorlaxes, but I'm not very familiar with her strain, so I'm a little cautious. But thankfully, she isn't here for me, but Crane. She tries scaring me by getting the Tweedles to name drop her, but they're a little too retarded to be remembering names and lets me know she's Bloody Mary. Because some of them, they think it's funny to have their little sleepovers and go into their little bathrooms and say my name five times in the mirror. <laughs> whoop de doo what you, what you gonna do now? Whip out a Ouija board? Now I may be a corrupt son of a bitch who's routinely stopped women at streetlights in the off chance I get to see their areolas, but if there's one thing I'm not, nor will ever be, it's a quitter. If you want this probable innocent man in our custody, he isn't innocent, doesn't matter, it's all the same to me. You'll have to pry him from my cold, Dead hand. Bigby? As you can see, even a demon straight from the depths of hell herself cannot do more than try to prevent the vaginal fluids from escaping. When come face to face with an average TCLR subscriber. She still shoots me though. She comes out with Woody's axe and like the deodorant with a middle schooler, she gets ready to murder me with her lethal weapon. But Snow breaks and offers up Crane for my life. Now I don't know why the crooked man would ever take this deal considering it's not as if Snow's gonna stop Bloody Mary. In fact, I'm sure the total calories she would take to consume is a lot less than the single calorie meals the Tweedle Twins are used to ingesting. But we'll get into the Crooked Man next video, the finale of the Wolf Among Us. Finally, Bloody Mary tells us Crane ain't no killer before abusing him like she was Brooke, the BDSMer. Standing, of course, for a beater of dogs, spitter of mutts, as that concludes the episode. As always, leave a like and subscribe to not miss out on future content. Speaking of which, check out these videos in the pinned comment. I'll see you all next time. Peace. The finale of our Derek chauvinistic resident wolf is today, someone I'm really going to miss after pulling a masterful performance over the last two videos, giving us an astounding 42 innocents arrested, 74 minorities oh! schlumped, 32 bribes accepted, 67 he was reaching for a weapons, 50 total years dealt out for minor drug offenses, and 114 abuses of power. It all ends today as we enshrine ourselves as the biggest scumbag. After getting bodied by Bloody Mary, nuts to the face, included in the assault package deal she delivered at no extra cost, we realize that the incel.com peruser wasn't the big bad after all and it's the crooked man who's calling the shots. For the first time ever, I'm tasked with protecting and serving this community, so are we up to the task? Can we take down the midlife crisis 40-year-old unmarried aunt, establishing peace and freedom for all in the streets of Fable Town? You know, if you're rich, at least. And I'll pick the blasted lock! Whatever the case, let's go smoke some crack off Colin's absolute don't be and play the Wolf Among Us on Crack the Finale. I wake up in my chair in a room that looks like it's about to get the almighty roast in a new hey. Hotel Hell episode. Following a blood trail until Bloody Mary shows up, and for a second having me thinking that I was a journalist in the middle of Iraq, waking up from the nightmare to Dr. Swinehart, who was enamored by the hollow tips. I got my bone marrow making its debut apparent. Hey, look, Snow, I'm the Shredder. But I eventually said it, almost turning into wolf form from the pain it 
brings. Doctor says it should be fine. What? What is it with doctors and Telltale Games? They'll look at you like this. Yeah, it should Looks be okay. Phones all look in place. Colin lets the doctor know he's shit at his job and that he'd rather let medieval doctors drill a hole into his skull to let the spirits out than take an aspirin prescribed by him and Raging Snow who tells him to get his money up and buy a glamour. Or she's gonna skin his ass and put his hide in a tanner. The doctor finishes the operation and tells Snow if she wants to keep me, she'll need to feed me every day, keep me clean, and neuter me if my horniness crosses the threshold, talking about me like I'm a dog or something. Really, nigga? Really, nigga? You know what I mean. I decide the best way to recover from liver surgery is to have it go through toxicosis anyway from liver poisoning before Snow lets me know it's Niagara Falls down there. Okay, but before I can me. distort her in the innocent minority maneuver... Yeah, you were really fucked up, man. You really, look nigga? Like when you take an action figure and bend its limbs the wrong way. Colin asks if he needs to switch sides yet, as this entire operation seems out of our pay grade. Snow then deduces that he's either invincible or desperate, and considering the fact it was Crane they wanted to save. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think he was desperate. After figuring out how big a threat the crooked man is, Snow decides it's best to do this the right way. What do you mean? the right way. Colin stands up for me, thank you, my brother, but I'm still confused, Snow. What do, what you, do you mean by that? So, starting now, we do everything cut and dried, by the book, straight as an arrow. What? No! You can't do this to me. How can you do this? This is outrageous. It's unfair. The breaking point was me turning into a were- Hold on, was she species shaming me? She sounds like she's species shaming you. What? No, that's unfair, Snow. Yeah, Bigby has the right to not be discriminated against. Yeah, fuck you, racist. Doesn't even make sense. Yeah, to a racist. I tell Snow what I did was strictly necessary. I had no choice. Well, if that's the case, please explain to Colin why ripping Gren's arm off was necessary. <laughs> He's had enough. He was still resisting. Fortunately, Colin comes to my rescue. Snow then comes after Colin and says pigs should stay on the farm. I can't let that happen if I don't stand up to my pig brothers. I'll be the next guy sent to Siberia. Snow gets a call. Well, I do, but Snow thinks that she's entitled to monitor my phone calls now as she's really serious about the ethics crackdown and says Nerissa's waiting for me in my office. As I get going to take a tactical jerk just in case she's still taking house calls, I reassure Collins he ain't going nowhere. He'll look human enough to me. In today's episode, I assume we're gonna be revenanting the first sheep we see. I shall await with bated breath. I ignore every urge my body bestowed upon me and somehow keep my sight at eye level as my manhood is quickly questioned. Before I tell her, nah, don't worry, I won the fight. I offer her a cigarette and... Puff and puffs. Alright, get your dropped your species for some dick looking ass out of my face before I huff and puff your dress off like it was made of straw. After whipping out her own Toblerone of cigarettes, I thank her for guiding me to the open arms but says she can't say much. Well, you better figure out how to say it faster. There are some innocent minorities that need the six beers deep and a 12 pack to the wife attack, so unless you're offering yourself as tribute, you better get over that spell quick. This line got her thinking as she implicates her friends, say, no, never mind, her friends are dead. I should also look after my own friends as they seem to be in danger. My paltry number of brain cells has her ready to give up and leave, but I compliment her ribbon before. Do you like it? I understand. You like it rough, don't you? Well, let's get rid of that pesky ribbon in. No! These lips are sealed! What? You can't! Just stay back! After acting like a recently transitioned woman whose dad just turned hostile, I back off and understand no BDSM today, comforting her and letting her know that no one is going to take that ribbon off. Unless, of course, it's the killer. I haven't really been able to stop him yet. I reassure her it's only Snow, but she makes me promise I don't tell anyone about what she told me today, and I pinky her before Snow walks in on us, looking like I just got done pinkying her profusely. Snow, after giving me the stank guy, <laughs> what can I say? I'm a TCLR subscriber. I can't keep the women off me. Let's me know she has a lead as Beauty just called, activating the sleeper agent who says I should go to my next endeavor post haste. Snow asks if she told me anything, and remembering my promise from earlier, she makes me promise I don't tell anyone about what she told me today, and I pinky her. I tell Snow everything that Nerissa told me. I tell Snow that Beauty got a loan from the crooked man and make my way up, as I can already hear the divorce lawyers hitting the gritty. I open the door to a hostile beast. What did I do to you, you fucking beast? 
You already know I did hit. You can have beauty and all her convexity. I'm here on strictly business. He gets mad that I didn't tell him I saw beauty back in episode one. Before I tell him I'm not fucking around, I either get let in or Federal Bureau of Investigation is getting a call about a suspicious man with a turban carrying multiple C4s who I saw walk into this apartment. This gets him to comply as he lets me in and beauty tells me to just excuse them for a second. One little thing. You want to keep fighting about that? Or do you want to try? We'll talk. Sorry, it's- They come out and I say their house looks awfully pricey. What do you, do you mean, mean by that? Listen here, you lumbering wildebeest. Ain't no way you took out debt from a loan shark just to upkeep a fancy lifestyle, right? I didn't know what else to do. We so oh god, it's true. As I walk around looking like I just took an aspirin from Dr. Swinehart after hearing the most stupid, most disgusting statement that completely discredits Charles Darwin's natural selection theory, Beast lets me know his valid concerns about how snitches get stitches, but I quickly remind him the crooked man's got multiple shooters spinning the block constantly, and if I don't capture him, they might confuse your buffalo-looking ass for an actual wild buffalo and start trophy hunting. This gets them to confess that they couldn't live in ugh, poverty and as they try explaining that student loan debt for some fancy furniture is a great financial decision the phone starts ringing hi there you've reached beauty and beast and we're out doing something fabulous uh, let me just uh... mr beast this is a thorough investigation every phone call needs to be monitored please step back Idiots, you've got about five more days with your kneecaps, so tell me what's going on before it's too late. After the Disney Channel climax scene, they tell me about the Lucky Pawn as the backdrop for their money laundering operations where the main cast of 500 Pound Sisters were hanging out. And they even had the Woodsman's Axe, which Bloody Mary almost used to turn me into a wall mount. After that, Beast told me he is under the employ of the Crooked Man in the butcher shop where he moves around packages and the only butchery they do is of the good name of meat shops. They start talking about how they shouldn't be living like this, having to take out massive debts to live well above their means in New York City where a gram is actually $40 unironically. They call me a broke ass right to my face as I tell him to come back to me when the Crooked Man repossesses beauty to be his headliner at the pudding and pie. I decide on the lucky pawn as Beast tells me there is some differences to choices in Telltale Games and to make sure to replay the segment again later. They ask if there's anything I can do to hopefully, potentially, maybe even uh, kill the Crooked Man, but not kill the Crooked Man. No sir, they would never resort to violence, but I tell them I will. Repossess the Crooked Man's debts after I deal with them. Has freed us. Oh, I wouldn't say free. More like under new management. I get to the Lucky Pond where Toad is trying to haggle Jack for a torn coat. Like, why are you... I've seen you take a torn purse for a tenner. Yeah, but I also got her phone number. I don't want your phone number. Oh, come on, that's not very nice. I would personally love Toad's phone number. I mean, look at him. That's a catch for any species. I ignore the fact that a two-foot Toad is walking down the streets of New York City as he gives me a speech about capitalism being theft. Well, you could always go to the Soviet Union. Oh, wait. This sets off Toad who spills everything about this shady operation and now the crooked man, my biggest stop as of this moment, is venture capitalizing illegal funds from innocent fables. I try to sneak in, asking him for a loan, but Jack says I'm white and probably have a credit score of 850 at birth and calls me out for trying to masterfully bait him. And I tell Toad to leave the coat, it's evidence for the investigation, and even offer to buy it from him. Keep your money, Sheriff. Of no patience for charity. Listen here, you pregnant amphibian. I offer to buy the coat for you, the entire reason you're here, and because it's me, you think it's a handout? Somebody check what year we're in, because I think the Jim Crow laws applied to some capacity to carnivores. I tell Captain Vietnam I know Rudy Zax is here as I try to link that to the crooked man, but he feigns ignorance and says they've never even seen the woodsman's axe. I ask him one more time just to ensure that I'm hearing him right, and he says yes, if I find a giant mystical axe, 
Pax. I can use him to de-stress my giant mystical cock. It's literally right here. In Times New Roman and everything. It literally says it belonged to the woodsman. It's even got its entire history. Did you think I was too stupid to read? Bring that pussy here. I get to whipping at the big B big C, but he tells me that Jersey owns the place and he's the one I should talk to. Fortunately, I'm just in time as the Jersey devil and the woodsman walk in arguing about said axe. As I begin to read this middle-aged sex is a foreign concept, as Miranda writes, he begins my Mocking me and my failures the last two episodes as he starts to believe his own horseshit spewing from his mouth and says he can take me single-handedly. Punch. Okay, the Slap Fight Championship series is yours if you want it, but he wants my bussy instead, and despite my evasive maneuvers, he won't let me escape as I decide it's time to try and diplomatically reason with him, first by showing him the last known location of Woody's axe before growing our camaraderie stronger, which leaves him comfortable enough to show me the real him, the one that put that one direction on full blast after making fun of it to his fifth grade friends. It was everybody. He shows us the secret back room where all the valuables are kept, and as a thank you, I decide to help him close up shop as I give him a makeover to help him lose his virginity at the age of 50 until Woody shows him the axe that was found on his premises. As he finally starts seeing this situation our way and after what I can only assume is a spell that'll make the furniture start flowing, he tells us we need the magic shard in order to find the crooked man's house, which keeps changing what door it's behind every night like a professional 20 year old sugar baby. He gives us directions to the mirror shard but I already know it's at the cut above and so I thank him for his service as he sends his condolences about the murder. Hookers. I decide to act like a nice guy and give the woodsman a huff and puff. Shitty friend. Not as shitty as your life expectancy. Instead of shitting on huff and puffs, why don't you huff and puff down a treadmill before heart disease sweeps your cardiovascular system? After giving me a pep talk so motivational, I ask what he's gonna do now when he gives me the vague answer like this was the end of season episode for a show. That doesn't know if it'll get another. I get to the cut above. Cutting above what? Salmonella victims? Bro's got four sodas, his meat looks like he's harvesting zombies from The Walking Dead, and he's charging people for this? The butcher walks out, and after I tell him that he makes pink sauce look like an FDA-approved consumable, I ask where the shard for the magic mirror is. He tells me to go down to the Lucky Pond. I let him know I was just there, and let's just say that horse face won't be chewing bubble gum any- <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> what type of threat is that? After that lackadaisical attempt at a threat, the butcher makes his escape. I sneak into the Schmeet locker filled with what I can only assume to be the cows that survived the rabies long enough to make it to the slaughter as I walk around like the main villain in any horror film. Peekaboo, I hit him with the take his breath away maneuver, preventing him from speaking and then using that to indict him to more violence because he won't answer my question. He tells me a story on how the crooked man's goons took advantage of his kindness to muscle their way into using his meat store as a front, but I'm skeptical considering all the cuts out there. I'm assuming you took out a loan you couldn't repay from the crooked man. After our conversation about his dog food, I opened the garage door he tried to hide, walking into a sixth grade science class with a whiteboard, ingredients, and slave labor. And he claims he had no idea about the slave labor and he was muscled out. What this idiot fails to tell me is that he warned the fuckers. I was coming, giving them the time to erase the chalkboard, and he claims, Where were you when they took this place from me? Do I look like Batman to you? Am I supposed to be omniscient? Hmm. Yes, that failing butcher shop just got forced into being a front for the crooked man. I'm on my way. I know our system favors the rich and powerful, but you would think Snow would take. Terrorists stole my store from me and are trying to bring the fall of Fable Town a little more seriously, at least. This was at least the place where the glamours are coming from, and that failing to repay loans gets you a role in the reenactment of the Black Plight pre-1865. I ask him what their glamour process is, and... You wanna talk T-Bones? <laughs> that I can do. Yeah, no bro. <laughs> no you can't bro. I've seen what's outside. If you wanna talk dog food, I'll still pass you over considering I'd rather gift my dog dysentery from Magic Johnson than the shit you're selling outside. The Crooked Man's family house sigil is apparently some guy on a Wheel of Fortune torture device, so if you didn't wanna look like the mustache twirling bad guy, you're doing a great job. I find a dirty coat, but it's too small to fit this fat ass's frame. Definitely from sampling his own food, that stalls all metal metabolic processes, no doubt fucking up his weight. The code is cranes as I see some of the funds he robbed from Fabletown for a bonus to the police force. Yeah, that's what I thought. 
If you don't want to see what a human T-bone steak looks like, you better keep your mouth shut, bitch. This fucker was still imagining his dirty socks as snow even after she told him she'd rather have a train run on her by German shepherds than even brush up against Crane's scrotum. If we ever want to solve Fable Town's money issues, just get Snow an OnlyFans account and watch his Crane single-handedly funds our operations. And finally, we get the magic mirror shard, and I'm on my way as this balding peak to track day in the fifth grade looking ass vegan butcher gets pissed at me for doing my job, despite his best attempts at thwarting me and how I'm still really the big bad wolf. He laments at Bloody Mary's strap-on making a T-bone into his rectum, but I tell him I'll handle it and to sit tight and maybe pick up a butchering course on YouTube or something in the meanwhile. I whip out a cigarette because... What? They're gonna turn the steaks bad? <laughs> Sucking an AIDS victim's dick is probably the healthier option than eating this garbage. I get back to the business office where Bluebeard and Toad are going Shaq and Kobe on Snow's ass until I get there, but she's in the boss bitch phase in her life, getting ready to lube up the patriarchy and fire a single widow of three two weeks away from getting evicted. Please. Look what I found. Seems your dog wants a biscuit. <laughs> That's like Bluebeard's my boy. Until the actual boy of this series flies in and fixes the magic mirror. I let her know the current situation on how we're gonna have an easier time finding the rabbit hole Alice jumped through than the crooked man's moving doorway. I go to help Buffkin until Bluebeard acting like he wants a word with me despite the fact he burned all of Crane's evidence but he's bankrolling our entire operation here at Fable Town Industries. So I can't do shit to him yet, but I'll be back for you. I do so enjoy our talks. I'll wait with bated breath. Buffkin asks what happened to this shard. It's getting treated like the runt of the litter, and I tell him Bloody Mary used it as her vibrator, which explains it. The mirror and Mary do not have a uh, really good history together, after all. After I leave him to a therapy session with the magic mirror, I'm told to deal with Toad, but we can't pay him for the car I destroyed when the woodsman suplexed me out of a window, episode one. I'm on Toad's side, honestly, but he did not take my offer to buy the donkey skin coat earlier, so this really is on him now. In any case, I really did break his car, damage his home, and cause irreversible psychological damage to his son, so I can at least give him the money Crane had pocketed, and with jubilation he accepts, and hits the chap dance finisher before walking out as chipper as effort to Snow's discontent. I tell Bluebeard it's time for our talk, but his bated breath isn't enough. He's a businessman with crooked, corrupt businessman things to do, and after reminding me he's essentially our boss, he makes his way out, leaving the business office staff to contemplate why on earth the crooked man wanted the hookers killed. Buffkin tells us the mirror is repaired. With so many episodes since the mirror broke, I can't wait. Not till Snow gets her question in first as we see more fan service for the comics. And then Bloody Mary notices the mirror using Psychic, which is super effective against the mirror as Buffkin explains to him what happened while dropping mad bars as his tradition. Finally, it's my turn. Mirror, mirror, I'm sick of dykes. Show me what Snow's titties look like. Well, can't sexually harass my superiors, I guess, so to save my job, I'll ask another. Mirror, mirror, the pics don't do me justice. Show me the best porno to really bust it. All right, final question. Mirror, mirror, I'm ashamed of my stick. Show me what awaits an average TCLR subscriber for his dick. Please, see how I'm all clean, glistening shit. That's hygiene, nigga. You can call me the health inspector. Finally, we use the mirror for the crooked man as we catch the moment his door just changes and I'm on my way as snow rains on my parade and says I have to bring the crooked man back alive. Finally, it's time. Making my way to Central Park, breaking down the door like a Kit Kat and jumping in half expecting to enter a Doctor Who episode as a cripple shows up as the first line of defense. He's here to take me to the crooked man and I shake his hand knowing he could get fired if he fails at his job. So being the average TCLR subscriber, I treat my tour guide with as much respect as the CEO. He tries begging me to turn back because the crooked man is the only man who cares for the strays who can't get their money up, which makes sense, but I'm still going in since my donors want me to take care of him. I wait up for him and let him introduce me as we see many familiar ops flabbergasted I've made it all the way here. And despite the numbers advantage, Tweedle dumbass gulps audibly, knowing at my scrotum's assuredly enlarged size since I walk right into the ops' base without any heat. We finally meet the big bad, the crooked man. <laughs> Bro. <laughs> 
Your face mask has started melting. You want me to come back later or? Looking like he tried to keep his eyes peeled one too many times and has to deal with droopy eye syndrome for the rest of his life. Looking like he's suffering from Graves disease. Not even to mention his nose looking like he joked about Mike Tyson Thutter right in front of him. He gives me a seat, but I pick the badass option and smoke in his own room. Oh my goodness. <laughs> It's time for the climax, the peak moment of dopamine production, the finding out what toy you got with your kinder egg, removing the curtain to find out who was sucking your dick. It was a dude. I tell the crooked man this you and start smoking his pack as Stan Lee whips out the silver bullets. I decide the, ah, uh, yeah, the huff and puff is bargain bin cigs, getting a gun trained to my head for the disrespect before Big Daddy whips out the belt. I list his charges and he acts innocent, but that isn't very effective considering his mustache is still at evil twirling length. He admits that the murder were made by an employee of his and he will deal with it himself. I've heard that line before every time I commit a war crime. Fuck no, he's facing justice, so hand him over. Now for the choice where you try to find out who did it. I personally forgot who the killer was considering these four options, it is pretty obvious. Was it the crooked man? No, he just gets someone else to do it for him. The Tweedles? Nah, they're his debt collectors that try to sell debtors as prostitutes. It could be Bloody Mary, I guess, but she seems to be the trap card, the ace up the sleeve, the level 90 starter after you sacrificed your other, level 15 Pokemon to full heal him after it faints. Using her to kill hookers is like sending the Navy SEALs to stop a bank robbery. Now Georgie, the man who had the prostitutes at arm's length under control seems the most likely option because of convenience and he was the person closest to them. So it would just make the most sense. Hey Georgie, take the ribbons off or I make a post about you on r slash neckbeard. A reliable threat to get him to do his dirty work. This man admits to killing them in 4K might I add like he's untouchable with a smug smile just like Joe did in the last Walking Dead video. <laughs> Crooked Man says Georgie misinterpreted his instructions. Okay, that makes everything better. Sorry for the troubles. I'll be going right now. If you need me to repair the door I kicked down, call up the business office. We can use the money set aside for Toad's car. Crooked Man gives up Georgie as the sacrifice who has the audacity to blame the Crooked Man for his crystal clear instructions. This is right, bollocks this. After teaching all the Americans in the room the British pronunciation of scrotum, Georgie asks the others for help. Damn, the walls have an incredible color palette. Bigby's dick is so voluptuous. He lets me take Georgie, but I'm going for the home run play. You're coming with me. Might even be able to fix your silly putty eyes in prison. He decides to show his hand and... Hey, would you look at that? I was wondering where the wife of five trying out a new look at 40 was. They hit me with a surprise attack, the WWE with a Jackie Chan finish. I get jumped having to go 1v5 as the Crooked Man and Bloody Mary make their escape. Getting caught in the Tweedles' is trap as Georgie tries to Portland my ass, but I swing last second as he friendly fires before swiper no swiping. The knife and prep Georgie for an anatomy lesson. The Wendigo wants smoke and I give it to him, breathing in his face, causing his enlarged nose to react negatively while the hooker and her man escapes. I hit the Native American monster with the US Manifest Destiny special, super effective against anything native, and while I'm not sure if Tweedle is alive, note that this is a telltale game and he's technically a determinant character, so it's safe to assume he's dead. I get to the dump truck that Meta fought wars over as she makes her escape with Georgie, but I get there just in time, cutting away to limit the budget they had to spend animating my transformation. I chase them across the city of New York that has a population of about 40 million as a seven foot werewolf and while some might say it's hypocritical considering I just told Toad next time I catch him without a glamour he's getting sent straight to Siberia I counter with I'm a cop who's gonna stop me these hops Bigby is playing for the wrong Timberwolves. Eventually, I have to let the crooked man leave as she throws me off the roof, but it's fine. There's no way she charges a 10-foot wolf, right? There's no way he stays in front of a moving car, right? He's not moving. Keep going! Eventually I try to scout out the perimeter and just like Assassin's Creed I see them walk back into the one place I would find them in. Good thing I find some clothes that are the exact same type, color, shape, size, and hue for me. 
After doing my God-given duty of protecting and serving the community by robbing their Abercrombie and Fitch stash, I walk into Georgie trying to get one last sucky sucky before he catches the business end of my blicky. He laments at my dumbassery for not going after the mastermind, but I tell him I'm coming for both of you. These police brutalities are getting handed out like Girl Scout cookies to an obese Walmart employee. Vivian steps in and that dump truck has me mesmerized so I back off and put in my Rizzer training from my Hogwarts Legacy video. Getting her to side with me against Georgie too saying he had to do it or else the crooked man would come after Vivian. He tells me Vivian is the original ribbon wielder and that the others are just cheap copies. It was either taking Vivian's ribbon and saving them or letting the IRL OnlyFans models take the hit. They wanted to open a fine, law-abiding establishment where they could sell off their sex slaves in peace after swamping them in debt, but the crooked man showed up and butcher shopped them, forcing them into his operation. If I really wanted to save the girls, then why don't I take the decision to take off Vivian's ribbon if it's so a bet I've killed for less? She decides to put the figurative gun to her head, lamenting at how everyone has control of her, and she wants to take her own life into her own hands for once. Five seconds later after that decision, she Louis the 18th herself from her PTSD guilt. You happy now, you Scottish tattoo canvas? I tell him to get up, but showing me his innards, I realize that's not gonna happen. Not the person from this duo whose innards I'd want to rearrange, but I guess it's better than nothing. I agree to give the Crooked Man the same treatment once I find him as me and Georgie come to terms, giving me the Crooked Man's location, and he asks me to finish the job to prevent him from suffering. What? And by the way, me? There me? You break the police ethics code? I protect and serve, my friend. I can't do that. In any case, hope dying slowly is fun, bitch. I get to the Metalworks building and bust in as it seems Sneeko made another collage of people who were in his feelings in typical fashion. He wanted to fight me but was too pussy to step up. So he sent Bloody Mary who came out of nowhere with a teleportation jutsu before winding up and hitting me like she was Popeye after downing a can of spinach. Crooked Man says he's leaving me in the capable care of Bloody Mary. How thoughtful of him as I try to sneak one in, but she's too quick. She tries to take off my pants and steal my semen, but my mother did teach me to never stick my dick in crazy, forcing her off. Now it's the first time I've actually listened to that ruling, but it sounded cool in the moment. Anyways, two minutes later, I'm on a balance beam for some reason as she starts giving me minor paper cuts, which while stinging do little to stop this TCLR subscriber. We get to see her final form looking like the victim of a Taliban attack after placing C4s in a window store. The problem is her defensive positioning of her glass. She has them all over her body except for her genitalia, tits, and ass. If I grab her by the tits, I'm immediately losing my Twitter account. Grab her by the butt and I'll have to deal with actual policemen. And finally, I'm not Donald Trump, so the third option is unavailable to me. She has me in a chokehold, giving me the opportunity I need and suplexing her ass off the lava works. Taken, I didn't touch her inappropriately just yet. I enter TCLR subscriber mode and she uses her shadow clones as I'm left trying to duck, weave, rope, and dope her until she dogpiles on me, forcing me to enter my final form. I'm a doggo. The goodest fucking doggo you've ever seen! I huff and puff as hard as I can, blowing her even harder than a veteran hooker in Houston when James Harden played there. Before we're left one on one as she has the audacity to jump at me directly. I don't think you have the facilities for that big you man. You can see here there's no blood around my mouth, nothing at all, it's about as clean as a dog's could be. You come to right before I split her in half, I have blood. Where did it come from? Did I stop time and eat out snow when she was making it rain? How did blood even come out? I mean, she's made of glass, evidently. And somehow my clothes are all stacked neatly into a pile like I just prepared to bone someone I picked off the club floor. In any case, you're fucked now, crooked boy. Give me one good reason not to rip you apart right now. Well, to be fair, that is a very good reason. He says he wants a trial to gaslight the community, and being the rich son of a bitch he is, I'm fairly certain he could pull it off. That's what I was going to do anyway, because as Bluebeard demonstrated in the last episode, I just want a treat from Snow. Now put the gun down. I think I'd rather hold on to it, if you don't mind. Hey! We get back to the entire hood waiting for me as I walk in, massive logs swinging side to side, shattering the earth, defeating Bloody Mary. The Tweedles, a Wendigo, and this dude who looks like a child drew a nose, messed up, and drew another nose right under. Snow's absolutely kerfuffled beyond belief that I didn't murder this guy the second I found him. Everyone is advocating to throw this crook down the wishing well, but Snow wants 
democracy and human rights and all that other foreign shit brought in by brown immigrants so we have to play by her rules. Although we can't set up a proper trial so she's only feigning democratic rule, this dude's getting about as fair a trial as an anti-Stalinist during the Great Purge. She starts listing out the crooked man's charges, assault, murder. He then chimes in saying he didn't actually murder those women and it was actually Georgie. The town asks where the Scotsman is and I tell them he fucked around and found out. Seriously, everyone in that fight had superpowers. A Wendigo, impenetrable blubber, and Georgie running around with a knife like that Fedora was gonna give him gentlemanly powers or whatever. Running around with that knife acting like he wouldn't get stabbed. In any case, he is charged with murder, inciting violence, assault against an officer, assault against an officer again, using my power to give him more jail time, forced prostitution, fraud, extortion, racketeering, illegal sale of magical artifacts, playing the new Harry Potter game, rape, questioning YouTube's decision, showing nudity on Twitch without being an attractive woman, the Holocaust, and calling out attractive women for having sex on stream. He calls me out on the last couple. Why don't you back it up with a source? My source is that I made it the fuck up. With the last three felonies I mentioned, I'm fairly certain we can get him on Firing Squad. We decide against the democratic will of the people to let him speak. Uh, it kind of makes you think. What ain't letting him speak now be considered totalitarian? He says they were acting on his behalf, but misinterpreted the orders. You know how it goes with subordinates. You tell them to get the Jews, and they just gas the Jews. <laughs> this gets Lawrence angry, but the crooked man doesn't speak clownfish, telling him, and everybody, you could get the same experience he had on his wedding night for $5.99 an hour. Beauty and Beast chime in. No surprise there. If the crooked man dies, they're now debt-free. He goes on about helping Auntie Greenleaf get her tree back and use that to help other fab- Ah shit, I know where this is going. We get called out for attempting arson, but she was working for the crooked man, that's- what do you mean it wasn't her fault? She worked for a supervillain, you just fall into that. Finally, with the trial on the line, Snow gives a speech about how he's just extorting you and we are the ones who really care about you. I mean, Butcher. Big B only assaulted you because he loves you. Gren, he ripped your arm to pieces, maimed your ass because he wanted to be your second arm. Somebody to rely on. Beast, Bigby only gave your wife the filet mignon up the uterus because he wanted to remind you that he'll always be right here, right inside of you. Also, if we convict him, everyone's debts are wiped clean. After checkmating him, devastating him with our elite bribes, he asks us for the source. Of course we have a source, Bigby. Bigby? Wait. I was actually supposed to find evidence. He doesn't believe the confession is evidence enough because number one, Georgie is dead and only I heard it. Plus, when accounting for my history... What are you talking about? <coughs> he also claims that if he's to be held responsible for his employees' actions, White should be responsible for mine. Before listing off every law I've skirted in the past 15 years, cumulatively, it would probably get me about 300 life sentences minimum if I get convicted. I mean, all I can say is I'd be the greatest wide receiver Fox River Penitentiary's ever seen. Also, I can't even lie, Crooked Man goes stupid with this line. We lashed our ropes to this disease world, and ever since, which one of us has been there for you? Who filled your lives with the promise of more? Who was there while they idly played in their towers, judging you, treating you as mindless children, too stupid to command your own destiny? Without me, who will pay your rent when you're on the verge of eviction? Who will dare challenge their brutality when it leaks to our dear citizens? Who will protect you from the big bad wolf? Now, I'm not gonna lie, that was some heat. So hot and fat that Nerissa had to come out of nowhere and hits her with the sexual assault after 20 years allegations. And considering the predicament we're in, we decide to take her words as fact, even though it's only her word against him. Nope, it's another five hookers to the rescue. This is the clearest video I've ever seen. This is the most HD shit ever. This is 4K! How did they get you in 4K? We start arguing what punishment is befitting the crime, and of course the people in debt want him eliminated, while the non-indebtors want him just in prison where he can still collect his checks. Everyone is arguing for a different course of action, and I say let's leave it up to the democratic will of the people. <laughs> Bluebeard convinces them to give the vote to me, assuredly because of the high likelihood I'll abuse the prisoner and murder him, which I think about, but I decide I should- Not this way! 
Yeah, all right, well, it seems like the lanky eighth grader after a growth spurt got me lacking. But considering his body mass is held together by threads and sinew instead of muscle, I easily break free and expose myself to the entire town. I decide it's probably best for me to lock him up to try to increase my standing to the public as Auntie Greenleaf tells us to let her cook. After which, we get to this bug, which is crazy. I wonder which of these four choices would lead to the optimal outcome for my playthrough. I reload the game only to find that the crooked man is going to be spending his next debt collection on bird feed instead of more hookers to expand his thriving collection of strip clubs. Bug catcher got his job back. <laughs> That's what I've been waiting for. As we cut to me cutting in front of the line where all the now unemployed crooked man's lackeys are waiting for a government stimmy pack. I try to riz up Snow one last time, but she's too busy trying to fix the corrupt system, so I leave before my past is brought to light. Afterwards, Bluebeard comes out of nowhere, and I think it's safe to assume he stole my girl. Of course, I couldn't compete with Lee's urbanness, but it still hurts nonetheless. As I'm browsing the tallest buildings in NYC, Colin walks in and as I tell him to hide or our corruption will get exposed. Damn! Colin's back in a fatty! He about to have me acting up like... I get outside to give Bugcatcher his keys and... Toad. I should have known my choices wouldn't matter. Why the fuck is this three foot toad after I gave him money I rightfully stole going to the farm? TJ simping as usual wants me to give Snow a special bug, oblivious to the fact that the crooked man's already about six feet deep. Mr. Toad asks me where Colin is. After all, if him and his son are gonna get deported to Siberia, Colin should be there too. And I say, no, 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 no. Colin is a revolutionary to the bone. And then I tell him me no ablo ingle for no further questions. The truck runs off as I decide a consolation prize is in order as I try to remove the image of Bluebeard completely limiting Snow's diaphragmatic mood movements from my mind as Nerissa still doesn't want to take off the ribbon. Mainly because of post-traumatic stress disorder, but I also admitted I like the ribbon twice, so I'll take that as a hint. She tells me about the plan with Faith and Lily where they were going to escape forced prostitution, but the others went too far and stole some photos for dirt on the crooked man's allies. They immediately had to call in professionals to finish them off, getting the people who got Jeffrey Epstein to commit suicide by stabbing himself in the chest four times before shooting himself in the back of the head. This all spooked Nerissa, who was the one who told on her girls to the crooked man, thinking Georgie could be reasoned with, and then he murdered the other two. I touch her arm because a girl in emotional distress is essentially free. JFK taught me that. That sounds like the gentle knock of a vulnerable teenage girl. Nothing bad ever happens to the Kennedys. Wow! That means you didn't hear the crooked man order Georgie to kill your friends. She starts telling me to believe all women even though there were no corroborators to her story like she said. So I mean, I really lose here if I snitch myself considering we probably turned an innocent man into a crow without due process. And honestly, thinking back on it, he, he, he might have actually been innocent and you know, it probably wouldn't have taken too long to ask the other five hookers what happened, but in any case, if I told the town, well, it wouldn't go over too well, so I decided to keep my mouth shut. Finally, she explains how she's the one who put the head on my doorstep to give me the first of Blues' clues setting me on this path. Finally, she gives me a pep talk on how it was me and my decisions that finally gave Fabletown and the Strays their justice. Even though the crooked man still might not have actually ordered the murder, so let's put a pin on that justice. She gives me a line reminiscent of Faith's at the start of the game, but I'm too busy staring at that bootay until it finally registers and I decide to run after her. Ending the wolf. Yes. If you enjoyed, leave a like and subscribe to not miss out on future crackery and check out these other videos linked down below in the pinned comment. And I'll see you all next time. Peace.